Let's face it, in our busy lives, we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. In fact, according to the CDC, only 1 in 10 Americans are eating the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables each day, missing out on essential vitamins, minerals, fibers, and antioxidants. And that's where Balance in Nature comes in. Balance in Nature sources only the best produce, free from pesticides, heavy metals, and harmful bacteria. And Balance in Nature is the best fruit and vegetable product on the market. They use only fresh whole fruits and vegetables inside each capsule. They don't use any GMOs, fillers, binding agents, or preservatives of any kind. You're getting real food, real science, real nutrition. I would never endorse a product that I don't use myself, and since using Balance in Nature, I feel more alert, I have more energy, my focus is sharper, and I feel great. Live life to the fullest and choose Balance in Nature. And guess what? PAS Report listeners can get 35% off the first preferred order. Start getting the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables you need by using code PAS at balanceofnature.com. Welcome to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. The PAS Report provides an honest analysis on the critical issues that matter to you without the biased media filter. Here's your host, Professor Nicholas Giordano. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Nick Giordano. And last week, I did the episode on the dismal state of our education system, how we continue to lower standards in order to cycle students through the system. Even though they lack basic proficiency levels, we're still pushing them and promoting them to the next grade, and they'll fall further behind. We, we failed when it comes to education. It's important to take note of that. And as our education system continues to collapse, even the lower standards can no longer hold up the house of cards that exist. I mean, ACTS test scores are now at their lowest levels in 30 years. According to the report, 42% of students didn't meet basic benchmarks in English and reading, math, and science. While many like to blame COVID and the distance learning that took place with the lockdowns, this is a trend we've been witnessing for over five years. And even though the authoritarian decrees exacerbated the problems, the results were always inevitable. We were going to get to this point sooner or later. The, the pandemic just sped up the inevitable. The fact is that many students today do not meet college readiness benchmarks, yet they are still cycle through the system. Why is that? And the real question becomes, why hasn't anyone been held accountable? I provided dozens of metrics since I first started this podcast showing this downward spiral, yet no one is ever held accountable. Why not? Obviously, what we're doing is not working and it needs to change. Even worse is that when you look at the problems within our country, a lot of it stems from this elitist attitude where they believe they are much smarter than everyone else, but the truth is they're not that smart. They continually bash our country and the idea of America, yet they don't know the first thing about America. They overgeneralize and have no idea about our unique history, a history that has propelled America to greatness. It's why I want to talk to Fox News' Brian Kilmeade. Brian is someone who has deep love and appreciation of American history. He has written several books highlighting some of the little-known stories that make this country so great. And his recent book, it's now out in paperback, The President and the Freedom Fighter, it's a fascinating book that the relationship between two American heroes, President Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, how the two went from strong disagreement to friendship and, and forever changed the course of history. It really is unique. And unfortunately, today we have an entire student body that has no idea who Frederick Douglass is. No idea. Before I bring on Bart Bryan, be sure to follow the podcast so you never miss an episode, share it with others. Also, visit the PAS Report website, pasreport.com. And with that out of the way, I want to welcome Brian Kilmeade to the PAS Report, author of The President and the Freedom Fighter, now on paperback. Brian, great to have you back on the program. How are you today? Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, I'm glad you could be here. Your book is so important. As someone that teaches political science, uh, I'm always astounded how many students don't know about Frederick Douglass. I know. Uh, what do you think about that? Like, wh why not? He's such a pinnacle figure in our history. You know, I, I don't even think you should criticize even this generation. I, it turns out that after he died, you know, his pinnacle was the Civil War. He wanted to get uh, the right to vote. He wanted to get for a full citizenship. He got it. And then after Lincoln died, he was linked to Lincoln, and then he fought for women's rights, and he made that his new civil rights. In fact, the day he died, he was going to go to appearance. He ended up uh, dying in his uh, hallway of his house, but he was going to go do something with Susan B. Anthony and everyone. So just a remarkable guy. But he even admitted that that was his zenith, getting to the point where he helped uh, recruit African-Americans to fight for the North, where he got both his sons involved, that he almost became an officer, that he quickly worked with Lincoln to the point 
that he was invited to stay uh, to attend as a second inaugural uh, and was on the dais, you know, on the dais on the platform. And he said, you know, and of course, uh, famously, as he was recounting in his own book, Douglas said he made eye contact with Andrew Johnson. He pretty, pretty much could tell the guy was a racist. By the way, he looked at it with disdain that a black man would be here on a day like this, the inauguration of the second president of, of the president's second term. So uh, then I find out I did not realize this. I just figured people just stay famous. But like right now, Grant is the hottest guy in, in history. He's like, if you could bet on any person in history, Grant is hot. The more people explore, the more underappreciated he is because people learn, oh, he's corrupt and his, and his terms didn't work. Man, he saved the country in so many ways after Johnson. But when you look at Douglas, it was, it was quiet. And to this guy, Phil Foner, uh, F-O-N-E-R, started looking at Douglas and bringing him forward and saying, guys, do you realize what a significant figure he is, what a firebrand he was? And then he came back into history books. I don't know about textbooks, but history books. And then, of course, the book of the year, I think was 2003, was it, um, with David Bright's book on Frederick Douglass? So then he became back again. So you so you focus, I guess, after World War, leading up to World War I, he was famous, then kind of in between kind of dipped. And then he comes back in the 60s. People go, like, well, who are these great race <laughs> leaders? And they go back Booker T. Washington and they go back further Frederick Douglass, who got a chance to meet each other and their families intermarried to a degree. So I don't actually blame the school system on this. But we learned about all this stuff. I mean, I remember learning about slavery, the hideousness uh, of slavery. No one ever soft peddled it. I remember little things like 1812 was one day. You know, uh, we never learned about the spies. Now they teach about the spies and all that. We didn't know it when we were going through perhaps but i don't remember much about frederick Douglass except for you know a significant figure so but i don't think that we should be indicted as a mostly white community working class in my case uh people that wanted to glance over great african-american leaders but i do think it's so worthy of discussion to think someone could be born a slave and within uh within a few years write a best-selling biography and become an internationally known speaker uh, uh, around the globe before he was even technically free here in America. I think that's a great story that needs to be taught with greater emphasis. And I agree. I mean, I, I constantly tell my students that I don't know everything about American government and American history. Like every year I'm learning something new. You know, several years ago, I was introduced to Filippo Mazzi, who actually played a role in the Declaration of Independence and his importance. Right. America has such a unique history. Do you think, and your book speaks to the heart of this, like you talk about that, they weren't always on the same page, Lincoln and Douglas, and there was some disagreements, but they were able to work through those disagreements. One of them was uh, about the speed at which we end slavery. Can you explain that to the audience for a little bit? Yeah, I mean, basically, if you're an activist, you're just pushing and prodding, you're pushing and prodding. This is what I think and this is what I know, as opposed to when you actually are a leader, a governor, a mayor, a president, and you realize I'm governing all these people. They don't agree on everything. If I'm a mayor, I, I'm, a, I'm a town, and I think that everybody knows me in that town. Well, there's going to be a faction of that town that thinks you're an absolute lunatic in here, and your policies are terrible. Now, the question is, how do you get elected, keep that job in order to be able to best represent those people, number one? Number two, um, how do I do what I, what I think is best for an area, uh, for, uh, for a country, for a town, for a county? Uh, how do I sell my point of view? Well, I got to deal with the people that put me there. And just because I think that I have the best way, if I don't sell my people in a democracy, I'm not going to get anywhere. So when Lincoln becomes president, he's the first Republican. When Lincoln becomes president, he's somebody that believes that not all men are necessarily uh, uh, equal, but they all should be free. You know, there was a consensus back then that whites were superior to blacks and the way it was. That's the reason why there aren't more blacks in high route positions as opposed to opportunity and education, which we all know is the case. But you got to put yourself back there in those times. So he learns a lot. He's moving through. He's from the Midwest. But he's got to get the whole East, Eastern board of, uh, um, on board. And even in the North, where they believe everyone should be free, he didn't believe that they didn't believe everyone should be equal. So if he sat there and goes, OK, guys, we're going to fight the South and the South are a bunch of rebels and we're going to take our country back and uh, we're going to treat the blacks equally and we're going to let them fight uh, with us, he wouldn't have had a country. So he has to go, OK, where's my country at right now? Forget about what I think. Well, my country right now says we have a bunch of states leaving the union and that uh, that is against the Constitution. We're going to bring them back. And if they we will go, we'll go to war if we have to put it on the shelf. Douglas had no patience for that. Douglas, are you kidding me? We know understandably why we watched the Lincoln. Yeah, we have a black guy. We, I watched the Lincoln Douglas debates. I watched how, you know, you were pretty much saying that, you know, America, we should be moving free and living up on our Constitution. Why do you change? Why do you change? 
because now you got the job. And not everyone agrees with the Senate candidate who barely lost, um, who barely lost in the uh, in the Douglas debate to Stephen Douglas, who wanted to be the next president. Lincoln not only Lincoln didn't get the Senate seat, but he damaged Douglas to the point where he actually got the presidency over Douglas. So, by the way, sometimes you lose in life to eventually win. That's another example of it. A uh, guy lost the Senate seat, but got everyone noticed what a great speaker he was. All those uh, all his transcriptions, his beliefs were in every newspaper. And the newspapers would go around the country. And not only were they wildly attended, but then the newspapers made him famous. And then Douglas says, I'm not going to go to Haiti anymore. I'm sticking around here. Got a newspaper. I'm, I, America could probably live up to the ideals in which I think that we can. And instead of leaving the country, we want to make the country better. Instead of being angry at a country that enslaved him and kept him from ever really knowing his mom or his father. He had suspicions who that was. He goes, I'm just going to make this better. So he does. Uh, and by the time Lincoln gets the job, Lincoln's like, listen, come back in the union, keep your slaves, we'll work this out. Douglas can't believe this offer was made. Douglas got, Frederick Douglas says, are you kidding me? Did you say keep your slaves? Because, yeah, because he'd have no country to put together. So Douglas is eviscerating him in the newspapers, say Lincoln's going back in his word. But he would eventually learn, and I write about again in that uh, freedom, uh, freedom uh, statue sp- speech that he dedicated to Lincoln 10 years after his death. That if he went, the, if Lincoln went the speed that Douglas wanted him to, he'd have no country. And he went faster than even his country wanted him to because he took some risks. So Douglas began to see things through to Lincoln's eyes 10 years after his death when he realized to lead as opposed to be an activist. Not saying Douglas wasn't right, but the country wasn't there. So he couldn't believe he cut that deal. He also couldn't believe that, that Lincoln came out and said, I have an idea. Why don't you go back home? I'll relocate you guys. Uh, if you all the blacks, blacks and whites clearly can't live together. We're sorry about slavery. It never should happen. Who wants to go somewhere else? He's like, are you kidding me? You're going to transport blacks out of here. We're Americans. You brought us here two generations ago. Now you want us to go home. So Frederick Douglass was absolutely apoplectic about that. And he was not invited among the black leaders to come to the White House in order to pitch this idea. Many people theorize, and I agree with it, that Lincoln was trying to show everybody. I tried everything. Ultimately, we have to learn to live together because blacks are going to be here and they're an asset to our country. They help build it. You see what happens when African-Americans are educated. They're equal to us. And he began to sell that story. And after we started having much more trouble, the North started having much more trouble with the South than they thought. The North goes, hey, man, if they want to fight, maybe we can give them guns and uniforms. So Lincoln goes to see Doug- Douglas gets online like everybody else to go see Lincoln and pitch his cause. Lincoln finds out he's online and they have their first meeting. He goes, Lake Douglas does not wait. He walks past sitting senators and he goes and meets and they meet for hours. The one on one. So if Lincoln is a racist guy that wanted America to be segregated, he has a funny way of showing it because he treated him with so much respect. And Douglas talks about when he first met eyes with Lincoln, he saw that this man was kind and sincere. And then they engaged and he listened and he couldn't believe the way the president listened. And then the president took out and revealed, I got an emancipation proclamation ready to go, but I got to time it at the right time. Do you understand that? And if we are ready, will you help me? And the answer is yes. And they had a follow-up meeting and this friendship burnished. And I believe overall, and I think that most people researching this or reading this book will believe that if there was a, if Lincoln had survived with Douglas, and now we know the character of Grant, not only is a great war fighter, but a sincere, honest man, knowing what we know about Grant, those three would have prevented us from needing the 1960s if they could have lived together through the 1860s. We've all been there before. You want to get someone the perfect gift for the perfect occasion, but you have no idea what to get. Well, you don't have to rack your brain anymore. Gift baskets are perfect for any occasion, whether it's birthdays, holidays, corporate events, or a simple thank you. At designeryselfgiftbaskets.com, you get to choose the theme and the products that go into the basket. You have a coffee lover? Try the K-Cup basket. You're looking for something special for the person that loves to barbecue? No problem. There's a basket for it. Make every basket unique to the person you're sending it to. And if you're in a rush and don't have time to customize the gift basket, it's not an issue because at DIYGB.com, you can choose from hundreds of pre-arranged baskets based on the occasion, theme, or recipient. And PAS Report listeners get 10% off using code PAS at checkout. So go to DIYGB.com, find the perfect gift for the perfect occasion, and use coupon code PAS at checkout to get 10% off your order. Visit DIYGB.com today. 
your focus and not just with this book i think all your books they, they show how complex our history really is yeah the the complex i mean even down to the constitutional convention of 1787 you had governor morris of maryland giving a speech on the sins of slavery and you're right you can't just sit there and wave a magic wand when you're doing the research and you sit down and actually write your books, do you, does it ever cross your mind how people of today in 2022 try and apply the standards of today to people living 150, 200 years ago, 250 years ago? Um, yeah. I mean, I do I talk about it all the time now. I do it on stage. I'm going to be in Brandon, Mississippi. I'm going to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in Newark, New Jersey. I'll talk about American history. In the beginning, I've totally changed it since the 1619 Project came out. and uh, we're a 1776 country, so we're not a 1619 country, and and almost everything they have in that project, which I believe she fronted, didn't really author, um, is wrong, including that the civil that the Revolutionary War was fought for uh, slavery. What? Are you kidding me? Oh, well, wow. because the Somerset Agreement allowed the British to get rid of slaves. They decided to get rid of slavery. They were fighting. We were fighting to keep it. They were fighting to get rid of it. Are you crazy? He, they kept it in all the colonies. They got rid of it, and I'm glad they did in 1760, I believe, off the top of my head. By 1776, we're fighting a war. And what they did is made overtures to the black population to say, fight against your oppressors and I'll give you your freedom. And most blacks either stayed out or fought for us because they looked at the British as oppressive as well in many respects, even though we fought together a little earlier. But that new word I didn't know about called pre- present, uh, presentism. This, the, and Bill Maher used it two weeks ago. He said, what's going on with our history? Guys, we didn't know what we know now. How dare we? put our values and what we know now on people that lived 250 years ago. I mean, and they were the smartest people back then, read what they wrote, but we know now. And the best example I can give is 2008, Barack Obama ran that marriage is between a man and a woman. If he ran that way in 2012, they would say that he's anti-gay. Now that if anyone decided to run that marriage between a man and a woman, they would say, okay, not in a major party, you're not going to run that platform because America's moved past it. Does Barack Obama need to be canceled? Should we cancel Barack Obama because he had that horrible statement in 2008 or George Bush because he had a similar one in 2004? No, America in just 20 years changed. So why can't we look back years, and do what we three do? Three years. Yeah, you three years. Excuse me, yeah. Why don't we look back like what you and I do? I look back with humility and in awe back then. I don't say, wow, I'm so much smarter than Jefferson. I'm so much more... I'm so much cooler and understand society more than Madison. Oh, man, what I could have taught Washington. You know, I just look back and I go, okay, what is the situation? Let me see the playing field. Man, what they brought to the table, how special they were compared to the rest of the world. Now, does does Washington turn out have insecurities because he never went to college? Does Washington have physical insecurities because of his teeth? Abs, yes and yes. Does James Madison sickly with epilepsy, who many people thought had no leadership skills, just uh, brain power, but no leadership power? Yes. Did Jefferson have personal uh, foibles and, and problems uh, socially do, and having relationships with multiple women at the same time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Did it mean that he wasn't this great intellectual thinker that moved our country invaluably through a, a time in which our, of our birth should be respected? Did he abolish slavery in Virginia? Oh, I had news from you. He knew he should, but he didn't. But I'm not going to judge him because I got to go back to Virginia in that time and saw the forces that were there and then had to tell all these farmers. They, that free labor that you have that's abhorrent to us then and even to him then uh, and us now and say, yeah, guys, you're out of business. Uh, free all those people. They will go, Jefferson, you're done. So he's out of power, out of influence. So we got no, we don't get the same declaration of independence. So I, I enjoy the complexity. I don't join the arrogance of the look back to those times that these people are showing up. Oh, I don't, you know, America's embarrassing. We had slavery. Really? Every continent had slavery. Everybody had slaves. The Indians, the American Indians. Now, Native Americans had slaves. So blacks had slaves in Africa of other blacks and other races. This happened through time. Read a book. So, you know, <laughs> I thought, we do that. yeah, Columbus. I can't give you the dissertation on Columbus, but I'm starting to go through Columbus books now because we up to Columbus Day again. And Columbus, as he did some important things, he also had the type of daring that changed the world. It was less impactful than the moon was in the 60s. He changed the world. And if you're a religious person or Christian, just know that no one spread Christianity faster with more velocity than Christopher Columbus. He gave it to these what he thought were natives of this land. 
They were not as accelerated as we were in Europe. And he brought it there. But when they saw a, we will not walk into a civilization outside, maybe some in the Amazon, that is that different from us. Okay. We might be accelerated, got more money. Okay, fine. They were walking into, they might as well have landed on another planet. The yeah. West was much further than where we go. No, North, South America and the Caribbean were then. So instead of them saying, okay, all you guys need is education, they go, okay, we're different human beings. We're smarter human beings. So just understand that. Put yourself in Columbus shoes. Know the risk he took. Take a look at the boat he sailed with, <laughs> where people thought he was going to go over the edge. So all I could say is you and I approach history in awe and we can't write down fast enough. I'm like, okay, let me not forget this. Other people go, oh, I'm going to protest against America. I'm going to protest again. I'm going to make sure those social studies books are changed. I'm going to make sure people understand that America is born on stolen land uh, under white supremacy. And that's what they're teaching now. And I can't believe it. We can go back and see the problems that they had back then, but put yourself in those times. Well, and that's the concerning thing, because you have over 4,500 schools that have adopted the 1619 Project, and you have people today that operate purely on emotion, not logic. They don't read. They don't understand history. They operate on emotion. So how can we overcome, and is that part of the leadership void that we're seeing today? You know, what's amazing is that in times like this, you want people to be educated. But right now, the, the things they're learning when they're being educated are the problem. So you think to yourself, how do you get people forward, get them educated, and understand the depth of these issues? Instead, they want to keep it surfacing, right? <laughs> and they're like, you know, if I put my hand up and I point out that uh, America and their democratic principles gave uh, generations of people hope and a chance to fulfill their potential and live the life they were, they were intended to live to the potential and dreams in which they wanted to pursue. If there was no America, no one would have tried it because kings weren't out there saying, you know, I got too much power. I'd like to relinquish some and have an election. No, it was America that forced everyone to do that. We didn't invent democracy, but we looked at all the other democracies and said, we think we could do it better. Let's let's try this. You know, we have the oldest codified constitution in the world. Uh, yeah. Out of all the countries that have been around a hell of a lot longer than us. And yeah. that's the amazing thing. But my, you know, when I get students, so over the 12 year period, I've given a citizenship exam to 2,300 students, only 300 or so have passed. I then give them the Russian constitution and play it off as if it's the American constitution. Only a handful can identify that they're not reading the American constitution. They really believe that the Russian constitution is the American constitution. And, and it's frightening to see where this future is going. How do you think we could reverse course? You're a student of history. You have written a number of books on leadership and right. what it took to give us our freedom. What do you think needs to happen? Well, it happened in Arizona. And in Arizona, they told, they voted, and it got reaffirmed to try to overturn it. In Arizona now, if you're a parent and you're not happy with the curriculum your kids are learning, do you take that, I think it's $8,000 per kid per year, and you take that to the school you want. So I don't know, for me growing up, if I told my parents, I got to go to, I want to go to a Catholic school or a private <laughs> school, they would say, yeah, we have no money for tuition. We're already paying tax. And that's what most people, when I found out six out of every 10 Americans live paycheck to paycheck, I, they can't add, if New York City, $55,000, or Greenwich, Connecticut, $55,000 for preschool. So or, so they figure eight in Arizona, this works, $8,000 per kid. So now they can take that 8000 and now they give it to the Catholic school or Jewish school down the street or the religious school, whatever it is, or the private school or the charter school. And now... If I don't like your curriculum, I'm not stuck in your district. I could go and make you competitive. Hey, why is everyone leaving? Well, they're leaving because they're teaching anti-Americanism. They're teaching values. They're teaching sex to second graders uh, with the benefits of different types of sex and telling people to don't commit to a gender until you're in fifth grade, whatever it is. Your kid comes home, we're out of that school. But mom, dad, guess where we're going? We're going down the block. And we're going to go to a charter school that's got the curriculum I want. And when they start losing enough kids, you're going to get a principal in there that's going to change things. That's my greatest hope right now. And that's a great point. And I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, the president and the freedom fighter, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and their battle to save America's soul. Everyone needs to check it out. Brian, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Keep on doing what you're doing with these kids. When you understand America's history, you can understand why people like Brian and I are so passionate about it. We are a vibrant country, yet so many take advantage of that and show such little appreciation for what America has accomplished in her short history. See, 
Entire generations of Americans have been lucky, including my generation. We haven't had to really sacrifice anything. And I'm not diminishing people's own personal struggles that they face in their private lives. I'm talking more broadly. We need to get a better understanding and grasp on American history and what this country is really about. And hopefully we're going to start making changes soon. Hopefully we're going to be returning to the core principles that led us to become the sole superpower of the world. Limited government. The idea that the government go that governs the best governs the least. The separation between the state and the federal government. Understanding that government's flawed, and that's why we wanted to institutionalize conflict. We got to get back to these concepts in, in order to make sure that future generations understand in America that we were able to grow up in and, and give that America to them. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Brian Kilmeade. I have all the links up to follow him at the PAS Report, PASReport.com. Also, check out his book. I have a link up to that as well. As always, please share this episode with family and friends and on social media. If you find the podcast informative, please give the PAS Report a five-star rating. Write a review on Apple Podcasts. I'm working on a great episode for Wednesday that you won't want to miss. It's going to be really important. I'm going to focus on a couple of different subjects, but all with the same underlying theme of how there is this effort, this extraordinary push to destroy our society, to destroy our culture. And I want to talk about that more. So it's an episode you won't want to miss. I want to thank you for joining me, and I'll be back on Wednesday with another great episode of the PAS Report Podcast. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. Podcast. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Also, visit PASReport.com and follow us on Twitter at PASReport. 